First Peter chapter 2. We are looking at uh, verses 4 through 10 this morning. So we took a break last week for Scott to tell us what horrible sinners we all are. But <laughs> this week we are back into First Peter. Looking at chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. So just to recap where we're at up to this point, um, Peter has introduced his letters. He's told them who he is and greeted uh, the recipients of the letter. And then uh, he, starts to talk, he starts to praise God for our privileged position in Christ. He talks about all of the amazing things that have happened to us, the, um, the new birth, the great mercy that we received, all of these kind of things. And he talks about the, the hope that we're looking forward to, the great inheritance that we have um, that will neither perish or fade or spoil. Uh, and these kind of things, the things that we're looking forward to. And then he says, what does this mean for our present? It means, uh, it does mean suffering, but it means that even in suffering, uh, we can know this joy unspeakable because we're walking through it with God and with this glorious hope ahead of us. His next step then was to, to say, therefore, and give us the logical response to these things. That's where we've been in the last uh, couple of weeks. And so the first big thing that he said was holiness. That if you're seeing these things, if you're seeing rightly what God's done for you, that you're going to live a holy life. You're going to have one that's propelled out into um, being set apart in your life for God. And then the second thing was love. This is the other big thing that's going to happen in your life is God's going to enable you to love in an ever-increasing, uh, ardent way um, to towards your fellow believers in Christ. And then he's going to go on from here to work out all of these things in the practicalities of life. So what does this actually look like for my work? Um, when, I, when I go to my job, how does this look in my marriage and my family or uh, all of these kinds of things? Uh, he's going to get really practical. Uh, but first, however, he has uh, one more word to say by way of uh, kind of introduction, and that is all about our identity as Christians, that Peter wants to say something to us about our identity, who we are. Uh, he wants us to know this uh, as we launch out. And so this is the end of, uh, and in many ways, the high point of the first major section of the book. <clears throat> so let's read it together. First Peter chapter 2. Starting in verse four, it says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's another magnificent passage, isn't it? It was interesting. Um, preparing to preach can be a little bit of a roller coaster. I have this passage and I'm like, this is amazing. What, what an amazing thing to preach on. But at a certain point in my prep, I kind of hit the reality of my uh, limitations to, to do any kind of justice to the great truths that Peter's writing about. So why don't we pray together? <laughs> thank you, God. We thank you for your word. We do thank you for these great truths. We thank you for communicating them with us. And God, I just pray that you would anoint me to speak this morning. Help me to speak your words. Uh, help me to convey the, the truth that you have and open up our ears, God. I pray that even as we, um, we take in these things that you're saying, I pray that we would be revived, God. I pray that these things would wake us up. That they would shake off the dust and help us, equip us uh, to live for you as we move forward. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, this passage, again, is about identity. Identity is one of the defining issues of life. At a certain point, we all start to ask, who am I? Why am I actually here? Does my life have any purpose or meaning? Am I a mistake? These kinds of things. Uh, what am I going to do uh, with this life that I have? 
And as we'll see, the Bible has a radically different answer for us than the world has to all, the, all of those kinds of questions. Uh, and as Scott said last week, the answer that we have to these things is intensely practical. That when we talk about ident identity, this isn't just kind of an esoteric discussion, but the kind of answers that we settle on and land on are going to affect uh, totally the way that we see life and ultimately the, the kinds of choices that we make. Uh, that how you live tomorrow and the day after is very much going to be affected by, by what you believe about yourself. Uh, and so it's important that we have an answer to these things, and Peter knows this. And so before he starts to get into all these practicalities, he writes this. He says, I want my churches to be established in who they are. I want them to be really clear in their identity because that's going to equip them to move forward. But again, uh, with these things, with these kinds of things, the world, it doesn't just have the, the wrong answers. Uh, it's looking in entirely the wrong direction for answers. Uh, that the world says, and especially in our day and age, the world basically says you need to look inward. If you're going to find any kind of answer uh, to who you are, uh, who you were made to be, you're going to find it with inside of yourself. Uh, so you need to develop a better self-concept. You need to find your true self and be true to that. Uh, you need to find the dreams in your own heart and live for them. Uh, these kinds of things, and this has kind of reached its peak of uh, absurdity really in our day and age, hasn't it, in terms of uh, gender identity and these kind of things where even uh, whether you're male or female, you now discover by looking inside of yourself uh, how you subjectively feel about yourself. Uh, and this is, this is the day and age that we live in. Uh, but the Bible over against these things tells us to look in a completely different direction. Uh, that if we're going to know who we are, if we're going to understand our identity, that we need to stop looking inside of ourselves, actually, and start looking to Christ. Our identity is found completely in him. And so when Peter has this section and he's writing on identity, he actually uses more words to talk about Jesus Christ than he does about us. So I want you to know who you are. Let me talk all about Jesus. It's all about him. We find ourselves in Jesus. Paul says something as astonishing as I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I still don't understand that. Maybe if I do, I'll preach on it one day, but that's how much our identity is completely found in Christ. If I look inside of myself, I don't even live anymore. It's Christ living inside of me. And if we misunderstand this, our search for identity will be completely futile. The more we want to discover who we are, the more we're going to end up being insecure and just not knowing because we, we just can't find the answer inside of ourselves. It's all found in Jesus Christ. And Peter knows this, and so he, wants, he writes about our identity, and he doesn't start with us at all. at all. He starts with Jesus Christ. And so this is our first point here, is just to look at Christ, our cornerstone. So verse four again says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. And so Jesus is this living stone. A little bit later on, he'll say that Jesus is our cornerstone. And so what is a cornerstone? Uh, what does this mean? You know, I'm not a, um, an architect or a builder by any means. I have built a wall once in my life. I had at the back of our yard, we kind of had this mound of earth uh, and Kim and I thought, wouldn't it be great to just build a little wall so it wasn't just an ugly looking mound, but we could make it into an actual kind of flower bed or something. And so, uh, so what I did was I dug one foot into the ground. I built a foot of wall under the ground and then a foot of wall over the ground. And I thought, I think I can do this well enough that at least a one foot wall can stay standing. Uh, but even if it doesn't, the stakes are pretty low. Um, if this doesn't work, I'll just go back to having an ugly looking mound uh, with just bricks strewn around too. Uh, but I'm happy to tell you guys that that was over two years ago and my one foot wall is still standing. It's going strong. And so I feel um, very well equipped to talk about uh, these kinds of things. Uh, but Jesus is our cornerstone. So what does that mean? A cornerstone was uh, basically just a very big square-ish stone that you would find. You wanted a really big stone. And when you found one that was kind of square, you would look at it and say, okay, this could become a cornerstone. Then you would take time to work on it to make it perfectly square. And so what you end up with is a very big square stone. And if you're going to build a, a good building that worked, you needed this cornerstone. You know, back then they didn't have all the kind of technologies that we have nowadays to make sure that a building is uh, integral and structural and, and it's going to work. Uh, so this is what they did. They would say, we're going to start with a cornerstone. 
Um, and once I have that in place, that every stone that I lay on top of it, I can make sure that it's straight. I can make sure that this thing's going okay because everything's going to line back up with the cornerstone. If I don't have a cornerstone, it doesn't matter how many other bricks I have, none of them are going to be useful. In the end, I'm just going to end up with a heap of rubble. But if I have a cornerstone in place, then every other brick can find its place in the building if it's lined up with that cornerstone. And so this is what Peter is saying for us, is that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. That the defining issue for our lives is have we recognized him as that and are we lining ourselves up with that cornerstone? This is the defining issue for your life. This will define your identity. It is how do you respond to Christ? When you've seen Christ, did you recognize him as the cornerstone? Did you say, I'm going to build my life on him? I'm going to submit to him. I'm going to obey him now because he's the cornerstone. Or do I reject him? And I say, I'm going to go and do my own thing. This is your identity. This does define uh, who we are. Peter knows this better than anyone. In the Gospels, he had his identity completely changed by Jesus. I mean, just imagine that, the Son of God in the flesh saying, you're no longer Simon, I call you Peter. Everything about your identity has changed now. What an amazing thing to happen. But the reason why that happened in that moment was because of Peter's confession. Peter said, you are the Christ. I believe that you're the son of the living God. Other people say this or that, but I've come to recognize you are Christ and I'm going to follow you with my whole life. Jesus says, everything about you is different now. Now you have a totally new name. Your identity has changed. Again, why not? Because you found something inside of yourself, but because you lined yourself up with the cornerstone, with Jesus Christ. So then Peter brings out this kind of dichotomy between who Jesus truly is and how the world sees him. He does this in verses six through eight with a series of Old Testament quotations. So let's read that again. It says, for it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So when they don't believe in Christ, he still becomes the cornerstone. That's just what he is. But for them, because they're not building on him, he becomes this rock of offense. Instead of something to build on, it's something that they stumble over. And so again, the most important issue for your life, the most defining thing is how do you come to see Jesus? Do you recognize him as the son of God and do you submit your life to him or do you reject him? A commentator called Goppelt said it like this, Christ is laid across the path of humanity on its course into the future. In the encounter with him, each person is changed, one for salvation another for destruction. But one cannot simply step over Jesus to go on about the daily routine and pass him by to build a future. Whoever encounters him is inescapably changed through the encounter. Either one sees and becomes a living stone or one stumbles as a blind person over Christ and comes to ruin, falling short of one's creator and redeemer and thereby of one's destiny. That's good, isn't it? So I want to say to anyone here, if you're not a Christian or perhaps anyone watching on the live stream, uh, if you haven't submitted your life to God, um, then Christ might, seem, might have seemed for you like uh, a very side issue in your life, somewhat of an irrelevant issue. Uh, but what I'm telling you is that Christ is the most relevant thing in your life. Whether you believe in him or not, your life will be completely defined by what you come to recognize Christ as. The choice is before you. Are you going to submit your life to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, or are you going to move on and come to ruin? This is the issue for your life. This goes on being an issue in all of our lives, though. This is why Peter uh, brought it up here in this letter. This isn't an evangelistic letter. He wasn't writing it uh, primarily to non-Christians. He was writing it to Christians uh, and saying that Christ is your cornerstone. And he was doing this because he knows that we have a tendency or there's a danger uh, to drift away from Christ. We respond to Christ because we recognize him as the cornerstone. But then there's plenty of people uh, who don't recognize that, who don't see that, uh, who reject Christ and who might even ridicule us um, for building our life upon him. 
And because of these kinds of things, we can become uh, seduced into going back to the answers of the world. Maybe Christ isn't enough after all. Maybe I'm embarrassed by the, again, the simplicity or the narrowness of my answer. Uh, now I need more persuasive arguments or I need more impressive uh, preaching or I need a, a more slick church service or I need uh, this and that for my own life. Um, and I forget that, no, Christ is the cornerstone. Everything in my life is about Christ. And so Peter's bringing them back to this place of don't move on from Christ. Every stone in that building needs to stay lined up with the cornerstone. Paul detected this same kind of movement away from Christ in his church in Corinth. And so he addressed it head on and said things like this. Uh, chapter one, verse 18 he said, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. So again, plenty of people aren't going to see this. Plenty of people are going to think it's absolutely foolish to build your life on Christ. But he said, to us who are being saved, Christ is the power of God. So there's no need to be embarrassed about Christ just because other people don't recognize it. Uh, that's okay. That just means they don't recognize it. But we recognize that Christ is the cornerstone. Again, a couple of verses later, he says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek for wisdom. So again, the world's out there looking for all of these kinds of answers, kind of the, in this frantic search uh, for these kinds of things. And Paul's saying, don't, don't get caught up in that. Okay, you, you're done searching. You don't need any more answers. You have Christ. Again, he says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we don't need to be embarrassed about not having any other answer in our lives. All I've got for you is Christ. All I can tell you is that Christ encountered my life and changed everything about me. I'm a different person now, and that's all I got. Let me just tell you about Christ. Let me tell you about what he's done in me. Again, this starts to sound more like identity, doesn't it? It starts to sound less like an, a clever answer that we have and more, no, my life has been changed. What is my life? It's Christ. So what else could I possibly talk to you about? And what if someone asked me about evolution? What if someone brings up this topic of, has science disproved the Bible? You know, you might have a great answer for that, or you might not have any kind of answer at all. Doesn't matter. You have Christ. I don't have the answer for that right now, but let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about what he's done in my life. What about other religions? Don't other religions, uh, don't, don't they all lead to God? Um, well, I don't know how they can, because Jesus Christ, right? If they don't contain Jesus Christ, then it's just not the right path. So I might not have this intricate understanding of all the other religions. I might not be able to give you an answer that satisfies your kind of intellectual curiosity, but let me tell you about Christ. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ and how he changed my life. Again, Paul says this again a few verses later. He says, for I decided to know nothing among you. Again, it's not that I didn't know anything else, but I decided to know nothing else except Christ and him crucified. It's a statement of identity again, isn't it? That Paul wasn't up there saying, hey, I want to show you everything that I know. I want to show you my great learning, my great understanding. He said, no, I'll put that all aside if I can just communicate Jesus Christ because he's my whole life. And Peter is saying these same things with this image of the cornerstone. He's saying uh, Christ is going to be offensive. He's going to sound simplistic. He's going to sound out of touch with modern culture. Uh, yep, he's the stone that the builders reject. Plenty of people will reject this, but don't worry about that. And certainly don't let it stop you proclaiming Christ. Again, some people are going to reject it, but we don't need to be discouraged by that. We just keep proclaiming Christ and some people are going to see him as the cornerstone and give their life to him. And so whatever we do, whatever we do, don't let these things cause you to look for other answers. If you're born again, you have the answer. There's no more searching to be done. You have Jesus Christ. Let us, let us go out and boldly proclaim him. You know, I've been married uh, for 10 years now. And what I found, yes, it's great. Um, what I found is that uh, recently when I've start, started saying that, and hey, I, yeah, we just turned 10 years. And I've had all kinds of people uh, responding back to me, well, what's your secret? You know, and it's like the world is so dark now that just being married for 10 years causes people to say there's something different about you. And I'm like, you don't even know me. I could have a terrible marriage. But, <laughs> but, but there it is. People are saying, what, what, what's your answer? 
And you know, there's so many things that I could say. I mean, I've learned a ton about marriage. I, I have plenty of advice that I think could be helpful. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's Jesus. Amen. Jesus Christ. None of those other things would be helpful at all. So if you're asking me what the answer is, it's just Jesus Christ. If you don't want to submit and bow your knee to him, I, I basically have nothing else for you. This is all I have is Jesus Christ. It is good, isn't it? Um, okay. Secondly, though, Peter then goes on after saying that Christ is our cornerstone, he does begin to talk about us. And so he has one main image for Christ, which is Christ is the cornerstone. And then he has many different images for us. We are living stones. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation, a people for his own possession, all of these kinds of things. And he piles these images uh, one on top of another for us. And the reason why he's doing this, it's not like a pep talk. It's not like he wants you to grab these things and look at yourself in the mirror every morning and say, I'm a holy nation. I'm a royal priesthood. Now I feel better and I can go out. Uh, what he wants for us is a deep understanding of these things that's actually going to change our lives. And so the first one he says is that uh, as we come to the cornerstone, we are like living stones being built into a spiritual house. Let's just read that again. Verses four and five, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. Again, this is just the flip side of the point we've been making all along, which is our lives are completely defined by Christ. Uh, that we're a living stone, the only way that has any value is if you're rightly aligned with the cornerstone. So all that we are rests on who Jesus is. Again, it doesn't matter how many stones you have. It doesn't matter how nice of a looking stone you have. It has no value. It has no purpose unless it gets lined up with that cornerstone. So who are you now? You're someone who's rightly lined up with Jesus Christ, that our life is all about the fact that we've come into right relationship with Jesus. Next thing that he says is that we are a royal priesthood. This is an incredibly rich concept. It's this combination of, of royalty and, again, priesthood. And the first thing to say about this is that um, these two ideas, royalty and priesthood, are, again, uh, completely defined by Jesus. That if I said I'm a priest, the next question you should ask is priest of who? Because just telling you that I'm a priest tells you almost nothing. The fact that I'm a priest could make me a very good person or a horrendously evil person. It all depends on priest of, of who. And so priesthood, um, again, has no real uh, meaning and definition in and of itself without reference uh, to who you're a priest of. It's by definition, its eyes are always looking back to God. Same with royalty. Uh, royalty, again, is all about who I'm related to. If I'm a prince, it doesn't matter whether I feel like a prince. It doesn't even matter if I act like one. Uh, all that matters is who my dad is. The fact that I'm a prince is just completely related to the fact that my dad is king. And so again, this idea of royalty points us back to Jesus Christ, that I'm something that I could never be in and of myself. I could never attain by myself. It's all to do with uh, who Christ is and who he's become to me. So again, these two concepts put Christ right uh, back at the center of our lives. Now a priest, uh, we could say, is one who stands before God on behalf of the world. So a priest uh, is one who has great intimacy with God. In the Old Testament, when they built the temple, um, <clears throat> you know, it was this dwelling place for God, but most of the people of God couldn't go in. All they could do was just approach the front gate. That's as far as they got to go. But the priests could go all the way in and start to sacrifice to God and start to meet with God. And what Peter is saying is we're a kingdom of priests, that every one of us is a priest. Every one of us has this special kind of access to God. But it's not a withdrawing from the world either. It's not, I'm going to reject the world just to be uh, by myself and God, that a priest is actually very involved in the world around us too. Uh, it's a life of prayer. It's that we see the world, that we're engaged in the, the problems and the, um, the pain and the misery, all of these kind of things. And then we can go back to God with these things and bring them uh, before God on behalf of people. 
The priest is going to be one who is uh, caring about those who are not born again, not believers in their life and saying, I'm going back to God again and again and pleading on their behalf uh, to become right with God. N.T. Wright said it like this, we humans are to stand at the intersection of heaven and earth, holding together in our hearts our praises and our urgent intercessions, the loving wisdom of the creator and the terrible torments of this battered world. It's so good, isn't it? So as priests, we're, we're moved, we're broken by all the things that are going wrong in the world. But we say, I have a God. I'm a priest. I have a God who can do things about this. So I'm running back to the secret place over and over again and lifting up these petitions to God. So if a priest is standing before God on behalf of the world, uh, someone who's royal is the opposite. They're standing before the world on behalf of God. The royal vocation means reflecting God's wisdom and justice back into the world. It's all about ruling well. Uh, that this, uh, this world desperately needs those who will rise up and say, I'll be one who, uh, who rules, who establishes on behalf of God. This is all about function, uh, not primarily about status. Uh, so the point of being royal isn't that we walk around and just know that we're royal and feel great about that. It's all about, no, I have a job to do. If God's called me to rule, then I've got to figure out how to do that in my life, in my sphere. Um, I, I was watching uh, a little while ago a series called The Crown. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. It's on uh, Netflix. It's about the British royal family, uh, and particularly about the queen. Uh, but it's very interesting. One of the main themes in this TV show is that... Um, the whole royal family, they have this amazing status that they're royal, but they have no function. They're all living these very frustrating lives of all I do is I go and I cut a ribbon and, and then I you know, go on a long vacation because I have nothing else to do. And it's actually a terrible life to live. It's all the status and none of the function. And for us, it's completely uh, the opposite. That when we say we're royal, we say, okay, I must have a job to do. God must be asking me to rule in my family or in my workplace. Uh, these kinds of things. The world, uh, again, desperately needs this. If Christians don't rule the world, someone else will. What it creates is a power vacuum. Someone else is going to come into that space and start to rule, and it's not going to be a good rule. It's not going to be a rule that reflects God. And so in our countries, in our communities, in our families, in our places of work, all of these kind of things, uh, we need to rise up and rule the way that God wants us to live though, in the way that, that he wants us to live. N.T. Wright, again, really helpful with these things. He said, the powers that have stolen the worshiping hearts of the world and that have in consequence usurped the human rule over the world would like nothing better than for Christians to shrink back from taking up their priestly and royal vocations. And so the world, again, Romans says that the, uh, the world, the earth is longing for the revealing of the sons of God, that it's desperate for Christians to actually rise up and be who they're supposed to be. Now, this feels a little vague, like, okay, I'm supposed to rule. What does that actually mean? Uh, the good news is Peter's going to work that out in the entire rest of the book. So this should leave us in a place of, okay, how do I get going and start to rule? Well, Read the rest of the book this week and you'll start to find out what Peter uh, says about it. And obviously we'll, we'll unpack it in the coming weeks. But this is, again, who we are with this royal priesthood. Again, Peter has a, a, a number of other terms that just kind of, they all kind of complement each other and just round out the picture. So he says that we're a chosen race or a chosen people, a chosen uh, kind of family group. This has to do with, again, with identity, with who we are, that we're changed so deeply in the core of our beings. We're an entirely different person. I've been born again. It's a new race in Christ. It's a completely different uh, kind of human that we've become now. He says we're a holy nation. This again means that we're set apart to Christ it has the idea of allegiance to Christ. It's the idea of pledging loyalty to him. It's I'm rejecting everything else, everything else that I could build my identity on, everything else that I could live for. I'm rejecting that decisively because I'm holy now to Christ. A people for his own possession is very similar again. It's saying that we belong to Christ. I don't belong to myself anymore. I'm possessed by Christ. He owns me. And a people who have received mercy, 
Again, this puts Christ right back in the center because all of these things are not things that we earned, not things that we could attain by ourselves. It's all the gracious work of Christ. God has done all of these things to a people who so didn't deserve it. I mean, if you look at these things and say, I don't deserve to be this, uh, then you're on exactly the right track. Yep, that's who it is. You are a person who has received mercy from Christ. Again, all of these things Peter says is that so that we would proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And we proclaim his excellencies in at least three ways. Number one, we proclaim them just by existing. The fact that you woke up this morning and that you've been saved by Christ proclaims the goodness of God. So when you wake up in the morning, you think, I'm already proclaiming the goodness of Christ just by the fact that I exist and that God's shown me mercy. That's a good start to the day, isn't it? Second way we proclaim Christ is by proclaiming Christ. So we are those who praise and worship. We do it all the time. We love it. It's the high point of our week. Uh, But then we go out and proclaim him too, that Jesus is always on our lips. Again, let me just tell you what he's done in my life. Let me tell you how uh, desperately broken and ugly I was, how totally depraved I was before Jesus came and did something about it. And the third way we proclaim him is uh, by our daily lives. The lives that we live without even saying a word should proclaim the excellencies of Christ. And this is really what Peter's going to say in the rest of the book. Uh, For example, if you're a wife and you have an unbelieving husband, you can proclaim Christ every day, but don't even open your mouth. Just by the way you live, it's going to proclaim Christ in such a compelling way that that person can get saved. And so Peter has example after example like this, but the rest of our our lives are given over to proclaiming the glory of Christ. So hopefully this all helps us break out of the trap of thinking about our identities as something we find, again, inside of ourselves. Realize, okay, identity is not about developing a positive self-image. It's not about discovering my unique strengths and I'll just take one more personality test and then I'll feel better about myself. It's about none of these kind of things. We're looking in totally the wrong place. What is the answer? How do we establish our identity? We get to know Jesus. We just get to know Jesus. Without an intimate, uh, growing relationship with him, a knowledge of him, a Christian is going to have an identity crisis. It's like we come to Christ and say, wow, he is the cornerstone. My life now is all about Christ. But who is he? I don't even know him that well yet. Yes, as a Christian, we say the most urgent thing that I can do is get to know Christ. If my identity is completely found in him, then I've got to get to know him. I went to uh, Carthage College uh, to study music. uh, And one of of my fellow musicians, a um, a wonderful pianist, um, introduced himself at the beginning. My name's Matt, but I'd like people to know me as Sir Gaga. That is, what he, that is what he said. So he's a big fan of Lady Gaga and he wanted to build his identity on her to the point that he said, I want people to know me as Sir Gaga. I'll never forget the first time that I met him and he said, yeah, me and Lady Gaga and Beethoven, we're all just kind of kindred spirits. And I thought, what, what a bizarre uh, thing to say, but nice to meet you too. Um, so anyway, obviously, what a ridiculous thing to build uh, your life on. I mean, if you're going to choose a pop star, at least choose a good one. Am I right? <laughs> um, but, but obviously, uh, completely, uh, completely the wrong place. But the one thing that he did really well is once he decided what he was going to build his identity on, he did actually build it on that. So he knew every one of her songs. He watched every interview that he possibly could. He wanted to know about this person. She, uh, he knew her, um, her tour dates, would go and see her as much as he could, all of these kinds of things. But what he had at least done, he put his identity in totally the wrong place, but at least he committed to it. I mean, he was genuine. He said, my life is all about Lady Gaga. And I think there's something that we can learn from this. Right, if our identity is in Jesus Christ, then let me learn everything about him that I can. Right? If my life is built on Jesus, then who is he? I want to be in the Gospels a lot. I want to see the way that he actually walked and lived. I want to memorize the things that he taught, all of these kinds of things. Thanks.
And so this is our final point here, is that what does Peter say about all of these kind of things, these great and lofty concepts, is he says, come to him. That again, right at the beginning of our passage, uh, he says these, all of these things happen as you come to him, the living stone. So what do we do? We just come to Christ uh, over and over again. This passage uh, in our letter is kind of unique. Uh, the whole rest of this book is filled with uh, commands. It's a relatively short letter, and I went through and counted them, and I found 45 different commands. So Peter has a lot of things that he wants to tell us to do, but in this passage, he doesn't give us any commands. It's not do this and do that and do this. It's no, you are this. You are that. This is who you are. But again, all of this is true uh, when it's framed by this first conditional phrase, which is as you come to him, as you come to him. And there's a sense in which all of these things become true about us the moment that we're born again. I came to Christ, I'm converted. But there's another sense in which these things become true about us as we develop a lifestyle of coming to him. And this then is the great command of this scripture is come to Christ, come before him, seek him, find him. This coming to Christ, first of all, it's a, it's a promise. The fact that God tells us to come to him means that he's promising that we can. And it's an amazing thing that over and over and over again in the word of God, God has promised to us availability. I'm going to make myself available uh, to my people. The prophets say this, you know, Jeremiah says, if you seek him, you will find him. If you seek him with all of your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. It's an amazing thing. Again, he says, uh, God says, call to me and I will answer you and I'll tell you great and unsearchable things. The Psalms say this all over the place, don't they? I called to the Lord, I called to him and he answered me and he came close to me and he strengthened me. He's a God who's available to me. Jesus himself said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, just come. You can just come to me and I'll give you rest. You know, these are the kinds of things that actually captured my life for Christ. I was brought up in a, in a great Christian uh, family and church and I was, I was fine with Christianity. I didn't have any problems with it, but it hadn't gripped me until I started to realize that God promised his very self to me, that I can actually know him. When I started to see that, um, well, actually, when I started to see it, I thought, I got to go to the Bible myself. I got to see if this is really in the Bible because it just felt too good to be true to me. You know, the church that I was in always said, if you want a personal relationship with Christ, and I thought, is that really something that I can have? Or is this just a phrase that my church uses? So I said, okay, I want to go to the Bible. I want to see God say it for himself. So I started to read, um, you know, the words of the Bible with this kind of lens of what does God actually promise me? And what I found was that I couldn't go a page of scripture without God in some kind of way saying, hey, I want you to get to know me. And I'm going to make myself available to you. And once I saw that, I thought, man, this is a God worth serving with the rest of my life. And if, if I can, if this is actually available, if I can get to know God, then I'm going to chase after that. I want to know him. Peter, again, earlier in this letter, he says, you don't see God, but you love him. Even though you don't see him, you're caught in this love relationship with him. Even though you don't see him now, uh, you're filled with this joy unspeakable because you know him, you know your God. So don't let the, the fact that we can't see God with our physical eyes uh, make you think that he is at all distant from us because he's close. He's so close. He's a God who's made himself available and said, come to me. The other thing about coming to Jesus is that it's just beautifully simple. Coming is such a simple verb. It's just, we just come. You know, we don't earn the right to be able to come. Even on our worst days, the invitation is still there. Just come to Christ. Even in your worst attitudes, or even in your worst mistakes, even if you look at things and just say, I've made such a, a mess. Jesus says, come to me. The door is open. You can come to me. Even in my dullest and driest moments, even though I know that inside of myself, even the attitude of my mind isn't honoring God in the way it should, God still says, you can come to me. I'll gladly welcome you back in. Reminds me of, of the prodigal son. 
And we all know the story, but when the son said, okay, I'm going to come back to God, I could come back to my father, uh, he planned this elaborate way. You know, I need to plan and rehearse what I'm going to say if I'm going to actually be able to approach my father again. But as he just simply came, the father saw him and ran towards him. That all it took was just, I'm going to come. I'm going to come. Again, it's simple. We don't need to understand lofty concepts in order to come. Even a child can do it. My, uh, my older son is uh, seven years old. And uh, it's just wonderful to see him starting to come to Christ for himself. And there's so many things that he doesn't know and that I want to teach him. And they're important. But even in how little he knows, God still welcomes him and he can still come. And I think, you know, for myself, looking at my son and thinking, uh, there's so much that he doesn't understand. I wonder how much God feels that about us. You know, we come to the point of, yeah, I've read the Bible so many times. I think I understand things so well. I just think God says, you know nothing. <laughs> you don't see anything the way you should. But come, I'll still welcome you in. You can come to me. And so this is our work. This is the, the essential work that we have. We want to be those who are built on Christ. We want to be those who are confident in our identity. That we then launch out into our day full of boldness, full of confidence. Again, it doesn't come from anything we find within ourselves. It comes from, I come to Christ. And everything is about him. So let's do that in the days and weeks ahead. Let's just come back to Christ and let's trust that he's going to meet us. And even more than meet us, he's going to revive us. We come to Christ. He's going to make us brand new every day. I'm refreshed. I'm revived in the presence of God. I come to my cornerstone. Does that sound good? Great. Well, let's be done. It's 10 after. Well done, guys.